Good morning, and thank you so much for um, taking time to learn about the Fulbright Scholar Program and the many very varieties of opportunities um, available through Fulbright. Um, Dr. Force um, and I, my name is Barbara Velasquez, and I am the official liaison for the College of Fulbright. We've talked about some of the cool things that <clears throat> have happened over the history of Metro with Fulbright. Sometimes we have faculty come in who did that right after a bachelor's degree Fulbright experience. So they come with the experience already. Sometimes we have people who pursue short-term um, experiences. Um, so it's just really exciting to see what's there and we're really thankful um, for your time. I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Amy Force. We're super excited that she's here to tell us about her fairly recent Fulbright experience. And um, I do want you to know that your microphones are open to manage uh, the recording, which we're gonna have available for anyone um, in the future. We would like you to raise your hands if you have a question and Dr. Force will take questions at any time. But if, if you raise your hand, then I can work on trying to find a point to let Dr. Force know we have a question. The chat, um, you can chat with me, but we've shut down the chat among everybody else. But um, thank you, thank you for investing some time this Friday morning. And please welcome Dr. Amy Force. Thanks, Barbara. I really appreciate that. And, and Barbara is being very humble here. She is the Fulbright liaison for Metro. So when I earned my, when I got my Fulbright, I worked with Barbara. So if, if yes, hopefully. Um, you will all apply. Um, you, you know who to go to besides me. So um, to get us started, um, first of all, thanks for, for being here. Yeah, on a Friday, um, especially when most of you are probably crunching grades and trying to get things moving. But I'm thrilled that we get a chance to have a conversation. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to share my screen. Can you all give me a thumbs up? Can you see it? Woohoo! Thanks, Laura. Appreciate it. So um, to get us going, I, I want to give you a little bit of a story about me. Um, back in 2004, I was just um, getting my, my world together. I had a bachelor's. I was through my master's. And one day, because um, I was at UNO, I wandered into a meeting about Fulbright. I knew nothing about Fulbright. I had just heard the name and I thought, oh, this sounds really exciting, you know, and they had some brochures and I just listened and I thought, this is what I really want to do. And I was thinking, I want to apply for the U.S. Fulbright Core Scholar Award. And then I looked at what it took to apply and you needed a PhD. And I thought, okay, no problem. I can do that. Yeah, right. Okay. Ten years later, um, yes, I, I have a Fulbright and I'm on my way to Hungary. But, you know, in the meantime, I kept that brochure at my desk and I just, it was my goal. You know, I, I had something to shoot for. So um, most of you are already in that position and you're probably, hopefully, thinking of a, a country in mind. To get us rolling, um, I just want to show you, this is an image I took in Hungary. Uh, this is actually Budapest, and you can see the Danube River. This was my favorite spot in Budapest. Um, I actually did not teach in Budapest. I was in a, a small city um, called Kecskemét, which is about 50 miles south of Budapest. However, the Fulbright organization is fantastic, and once a month, Everyone who was doing a Fulbright in Hungary, we all met in Budapest. So I was there quite a bit. And my favorite thing to do was to get up at five or six in the morning and go take pictures at my favorite spot. So yeah, it was about six in the morning when I took this image. So um, to get us rolling, I wanted to show you, here's some of Metro. Okay, we all know this, the, the different Metro campuses. And how do you get from here to here? Uh, this is the college. It was the Ketchkemet Teachers Training College in Ketchkemet. And my project for Fulbright was TESOL, the Teaching English Second Language in a Classroom. Um, this was in an ESL Hungarian classroom. 
And what did they want me to teach in particular, which really surprised me, but I'll explain why later. They wanted me to teach African American history. And then they said, well, how do you feel about American studies? And that was kind of loose and open ended. And then the big one, um, conversational English. And I thought, okay, yeah, I can do that. So, you know, Fulbright is um, a program that encourages anyone who wishes to interact overseas intellectually in the classroom, research, maybe a combination. But the point is that you do need to be a little bit flexible because even when we get to the end of the presentation today, I'm gonna to show you where the awards catalog is. Just because a host um, university or college has asked you to do certain things, don't be surprised if that kind of mushrooms into other things as well in the classroom. And I know that everyone on this call um, has, has a lot of extra strengths besides what we already do in the classroom. So I'm excited that you in particular are on this call. The other reason why I'm doing this conversation is because I am a Fulbright alumni ambassador. So my um, Fulbright was in 2014. I was there for a semester, but then when I came back, I ended up working with Fulbright for other reasons, which I will get into. And then in 2020, I became an ambassador until 2022. So um, I'm a little biased. I love Fulbright. So here's my overview for our quick 45 minute conversation. And then yes, I would love to have as much conversation with you for the last 15 minutes. I'm gonna go over why did I apply for a Fulbright Scholar Award, how I approached the application and what I did on my Fulbright. For me, it was not just one level. There was professional, institutional and personal. And then I wanna talk with you about how do you start your Fulbright journey? And there are some institutional Fulbright opportunities for Metro right now. Um, if you're interested in maybe bringing a Fulbright in your area to Metro, um, I, I will show you how to do this. All right. Oh, and there is the Fulbright office in Hungary. And I took this picture because to me, this was kind of like the door when you think about the Wizard of Oz, you know, when Dorothy opens the door and it goes from black and white to color film. To me, this was the Wizard of Oz. Um, I walked in that door and I just, a lot of things changed for me. So um, why did I apply? Well, besides that conversation I had 10 years before I applied and was very excited about it, I did my research and I found out that Fulbright is the gold standard. It, I mean, if you want to teach overseas, or you want to connect with students that you probably would not get the chance to, this is the way to go. You can do teaching, you can do research, you can do a combination of teaching research. You could have a professional project. Um, that could be something like you want to work in a certain country doing something that is very near and dear to your heart. Um, I will explain how you go ahead and get that, that together. Or let's say you are, are an administrator um, and especially at Metro, um, you know, our, our VPs, um, anyone who would like to apply, you can be a Dean, um, you know, um, anything with administration, the guarant the, the awards for the administration um, folk are less time because of course you probably can't get away as much as you would like. Um, for those of us who are teaching, you would need to go ahead and go on sabbatical. You have a chance to teach overseas. It could be a matter of months. It could be up to a year. And now we have something new called flex where let's say um, Helen, you have something you want to do. Um, I don't know, give, give me a country. Where, where would you maybe be interested in going? Uh, Guinea-Bissau. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, where? Something, how about Guinea? Okay, you wanna go to Guinea. Okay, um, let's say you have a professional project 
and you would like to work in a certain community helping maybe women doing something and you are going to write out your proposal and you could argue I would like to do this for two months uh, maybe two years in a row that would be a flex so maybe you wouldn't need to do a sabbatical or maybe if you're like I was when I went over um, you know between my husband and I we have six kids and we have nine grandchildren and I was like, how am I going to do this? You know, um, you can always bring your children or grandchildren in case you're wondering. The other thing about Fulbright and why I say it's the gold standard is everything is paid for. Your airfare, your housing, you even get a stipend on top of that. You don't pay for anything. It is an incredible opportunity. I, I cannot Dress that too much. The other thing with Fulbright right now is they specifically want me as an ambassador to be talking with anyone who works at a community college because, um, you know, let's just say I'll use Metro as an example. There was one other person who was faculty who had a Fulbright at Metro, and obviously we've been around now for over 40 years. And she was back in 1980. I went in 2014. I was only the second person from Metro. So they are very interested in having community college and they want as much like the diverse fields as possible applying. So um, you have a choice here. Um, you can apply. There is a choice of over 160 countries. Now, the one catch is you only can apply for one country. You can't do an application and say, oh, here's my top 10. You do need to specify, okay, this is the one country. So um, I'm curious, Laura, if you had your druthers, what country would you pick? Well, that's a good question because um, my first thought was Colombia, but then I thought, well, for a project, um, I might have to tailor it somewhere else. So I'd have to think about that a little bit. Okay, but Columbia. Okay. And remember, um, you could just choose te teaching. That's what I did. I, I taught in the classroom. Or mm -hmm. you could say, you know, I have some research I'm working on. And I really, I that's all I want to do. I, I don't want to teach. Um, so you or you could do a combination. It just depends. Um, okay, let me go ahead. I'm going to go forward. And I want to explain how, okay, how do I, how do I approach this application? Because it is a little daunting when you think, wait, there's 160 countries I could apply for. So the first thing I did was, um, and I put my one, two, three, four here. I went ahead and I um, did a little bit of a review for my eligibility. Okay, so do I qualify? Well, a lot of that is, are you an American citizen? Okay. Yep, that qualifies. Um, there were a few things like, um, had you lived out of the country in the last six years? Did you do another project in something similar to this? Um, so there were a, a few slight parameters, not that many. Number two was finding an award. And at the end of this, I will go ahead and I'll show you the catalog. But for me, um, you know, I'm only second generation in my family. Um, my grandmother um, came here to the United States between World War I and World War II, and she was Hungarian. So I'm half Hungarian. And, you know, she never even really learned English that well. She did not become a citizen until the 1970s. And so I had heard her and eaten a lot of the yummy Hungarian food that she had made over the years. And there was no other country for me. That, that was the one country I really wanted to go to because I had never been. And kind of in a way, I was, I was kind of finding my roots at the same time. So then I went ahead and I looked in the catalog and I looked through Hungary and I started thinking, okay, do I want to teach? Do I want to research? Do I have a professional project? What do I want to do? And then I started nosing around a little bit and I found the Catch Commit Teachers Training College. And obviously being a teacher myself, I thought, okay, that might be really good. 
And then I noticed something unusual about it that really had me hooked to the point where I thought, okay, I'm going to call these people. I'm going to email first. And then we, we set up a Zoom and then, you know, we were able to interact. But what I noticed was this teacher's training college, which I guess is very typical in, in Europe, but it's not here in the United States, was um, equipped to teach people who wanted to teach elementary education. And so the teacher's training college, part of the student's day was going to classes. And then the other part of the day, they had an elementary school within the college. I mean, this is accredited elementary school. And then you would go to the elementary school and you would teach. So you actually were taking what you learned in the morning and teaching it in the afternoon. And I thought, OK, that's incredible. And, and we need to take a page for that in the United States. At least I, I haven't really heard of this anywhere else. So that had me hooked. The other thing was Ketchikanet was a smaller city. It was about 33,000 people. And Budapest, which was, they had a lot more awards for Hungary because it's a very big city. You know, I'm not a big city kind of person. I wanted something that I felt comfortable. It was kind of Omaha-ish, that it was rural. And then I noticed that the weather, you know, um, Hungary is in the middle of Europe. So is Omaha to, or Nebraska to the United States. So our weather was almost identical. I mean, we're talking all the weird weather and the cold and the rain and all of that. And I, I felt very at home. So I was trying to find something that fit me. Okay. Then I went ahead and I thought, okay, I need to begin this application. Don't get nervous. The application is long. It did take me a while, but it's not because it was hard to fill out. It was because it had a lot of moving pieces. You also needed reference, but the biggest part of it was, well, what's my proposal? Sure, I wanted to teach in Hungary. And they, we negotiated a little bit over Zoom and they said, we really want you teaching African-American history. And at the time I thought, well, that's different because do you have a lot of African-Americans in Hungary? They don't, but they did have a purpose in mind. Again, I'm, I'm gonna leave that for a moment. I'll come back to it. So we talked over Zoom, we negotiated. Um, how many classes would I teach? Um, Definitely the conversational English was a big thing. I didn't have to know Hungarian to teach in Hungary. Most of these countries, you don't need to know the language in case you're wondering. I did pick up some Hungarian. Um, you know, my grandmother really tried to be American when she moved here. And so about the only time I heard Hungarian was when she was ticked off and I probably didn't wanna know what word she was saying anyway. But, um, don't feel like, oh, I have to learn that language. So Laura, if you wanted to go to Colombia, you don't have to be bilingual, um, you know, and speaking perfect Spanish. Um, so once we got the negotiation down, I was able to go ahead and tailor my proposal to the classes they wanted me to teach. And then I was able to say, and this is how I want to teach them. And I was very in depth. If any of you think, yeah, I want to apply, I am happy to share with you my proposal. It was five pages, single spaced. The more detailed you are and the more plausible, the more feasible your proposal is, the more apt you are to have it accepted. Now, I did apply in 2012 for a Fulbright. My proposal mm, needed some work. The first time I applied, I did not get it. And I allowed myself one day to pout and cry and feel really sorry for myself. And then I realized I needed to rewrite my proposal. So the second time I applied, I did get it. Okay, so let's say you apply, everything's going great. You do need to go ahead and set up sabbatical leave with Metro. And um, I don't know, Barb, if you want to comment at all, but it wasn't would like that. to jump in yeah mm -hmm. go ahead um, <clears throat> before we move off of that i just want you to know that liliana peterson has a specific interest in um a project in romania and the agriculture 
agricultural industry. I mean, Liliana can speak for herself too, but her question is, what would be the sequence of steps to approach a research and teaching project? So I know you, and I think you're answering some of those questions, but I want to make sure that Liliana um, is getting the answers to her specific questions. Thank you so much, Barbara and Amy. Thank you so much for sharing. I know I, I really respect you for everything you do and being so agile and collaborative. Sorry that I don't have my, my picture. I can turn on the video, but uh, it, it's not desirable right now. Um, I am collaborating with um, several um, institutions, Ministry of Agriculture, Academy of Science uh, for Agriculture in Bucharest. I look at the Fulbright when I saw this webinar coming in uh, Romania, and they have um, they have a university actually in uh, uh, Bucharest, the capital city. So I'm trying to connect now uh, Valmont uh, class uh, pioneer. Uh, the College for Irrigation and Drainage, Land Reclamation, <clears throat> Institute of Agriculture, Ministry of Agriculture together, also with Project Management Institute, that they do have also branch office in uh, Bucharest. And I would like to, they, they uh, are looking for me to be the connector to include some projects in Romania for uh, new technology, uh, we do have small farms. We, we Romanians used to have large farms, so we need large farms to um, purchase equipment of half a million, one million dollars, Valmont class, and also hybrid seeds from Pioneer American Company. But we would like also to connect with the Project Management Institute and Alfra, which is about lean and six sigma process uh, process improvement. Um, tools, uh, students in agriculture to connect them with practical applications in the field and also teaching in, uh, in college what they need to do. Because as you mentioned in Hungary, Romania, it's also based on applications. Everything it's half time uh, teaching, half time laboratory and uh, applications in the field. So my question will be, uh, and you started, as Barbara mentioned, you started to explain the process. Would be first time to uh, generate a, a potential proposal for project, then to contact Fulbright in that country and the institutions. What is the, the process? I have an upcoming flight to uh, Romania um, this summer and it's basically most most of it. It's related to business, exactly to to the project that I'm uh, speaking about. So, if you can share what exactly one, two, three, four should I do in the correct order? Thank you so and, much. Can Can I ask Liliana as part of your question that if you have direct contact with the country and entities within the country, including the Fulbright office, is that a good start? Is that is that part of your question? Right. What will be the appropriate? Because those companies that I mentioned, majority are uh, American, and I'm I'm in contact with the global supply chain managers at Valmont. So, how can I connect all of these, but also with a Fulbright? That that will be something of interest for me. Okay. Well, it sounds like you have done your homework, and you've got quite a good start. <laughs> Um, you know, half of that proposal is talking with the host institution that you hope to be with. So if I were you, I would go ahead and, and email them to start just out of respect. I, I try to, you know, go slowly so people have a chance to think. Plus, if there's any kind of a language issue, it, it gives someone, um, if, if they're not too sure of their English, it gives them the space to go ahead and write to begin with. Now, since you're gonna be out there this summer, I would ask if there would be an opportunity and set up a date and maybe a time that you could meet with them and ask them, what do you need from me? Uh, this is what I would like to do for you. Because if you can go ahead and show that your proposal is feasible, and that you have buy-in from that host institution, you have a much better chance of your application being accepted. 
Um, you know, there are people you are competing against all over the United States, and there are hundreds of thousands. I mean, there there are applicants, and yes, um, about 800 people are going to be awarded a Fulbright each year. But the more they know you, and you can maybe talk about what do you expect from me exactly, then your proposal will be that much stronger. Um, when we get to the end of today's presentation, if you don't mind, Liliana, I would love to have you be one of one of the, the guinea pigs. If, if I could go ahead and we could go through the catalog and just look for a moment, would that be all right? We may have lost Liliana, but we'll hold on to that as a possibility. Okay, okay. All right, well, I will go forward and I'm seeing other people on the call. So um, if, again, if, if anyone has questions, particularly about you, um, this is your space to, to go ahead and ask questions. So thanks Liliana. So let's say you go ahead, you do your application, you are accepted. Yes, you will have to meet with Barbara. Yes, you will have to fill out sabbatical paperwork to get leave. Um, the way it works at Metro is Every quarter you are gone, you will owe Metro a year for sure when you return. So what that means is, let's say Ryan, you go ahead and you do this and you are going to be gone, um, let's say from the spring quarter. And then of course, summer, unless you're 12 month, um, you're on your own. So you don't have to worry about that. But let's just say you're gone over the spring quarter. Then when you return, for sure, you need to stay at Metro Teaching for at least one year, or you will go ahead and owe some monies because sabbatical leave, you can get, I think it was like half pay, three quarter pay. I'm, I'm not exactly sure where it's at right now, but you are paid some from Metro to pay your bills here while you're overseas. So um, every quarter you're gone, yes, you do need to basically pledge, you will stay at Metro for at least one year per quarter after you return. And of course, for most of us, that's no big deal. Okay, so- May, may I ask Amy, um, yeah. perhaps faculty are fully aware of this, but is, my, is it my understanding that if you go for one quarter only, you get full pay as faculty? Is that how Metro sets that up? And that if you've be gone longer, it's kind of diminished? Mm -hmm. Like by percentage, you are correct. Yes, thank you. And and I admit, um, when I went, the board of governors, because I was only the second one from Metro, and it had been many years since the first one in the eighties. There was this question about, well, wait a minute, if Fulbright's going to be paying you a stipend, then why are we paying anyway? They they figured out very quickly that Fulbright. Um, it, it wasn't a money making opportunity, but it was an honor for Metro to have someone on a Fulbright. And so I was allowed to go ahead and do the sabbatical instead of taking a leave of absence. I don't think that's an issue now because that was back in 2014 and we got everything nailed out for any other hopefully future faculty who are coming from Metro or administrators. Um, I just want to briefly go ahead. I've got some pictures here that I wanted to say, okay, great. I, I got my application accepted. Um, the host institution was thrilled. We got everything worked out. I flew to Hungary. I admit I was super nervous getting on the flight to come out, you know, saying goodbye to my family. Um, I taught for a whole semester for a whole semester. So I was out of the country for almost five months. And um, I was thinking, why am I doing this? This is crazy. And then as soon as I got there, I realized exactly why, because I was teaching faculty. Um, that's a picture of me with my colleagues. And I was teaching college students. I've got a picture of them on another slide. And then because the training college in Ketchkomet was a typical college for Europe, um, I also got to teach elementary school students. So I had some first graders, which was kind of crazy. Um, thank goodness, I, I have a secondary ed degree besides the history degrees. And 
um, I had taught in the schools as a sub, so I wasn't like totally blown away, but it was a lot of fun teaching these first graders conversational English. I think the, the most fun we had was one day they were trying to understand how a school bus works in the United States. And so I said, well, why don't you demonstrate? And their English, by the way, was, was a lot better than my broken Hungarian. But um, they were demonstrating, they took their chairs and they put them all um, back to back because uh, in Europe, um, when you go on like um, the subway or um, the trains, they're always like one way going one way and one the other way on, on the chairs. They're not all going forward like in a school bus. And then I explained that's, that's how it would be in a school bus. I turned the chairs around all going forward and the look on their faces was, was priceless. They were like, oh, okay, that's a little different. Um, Anyway, so I learned a lot. Um, Hungarians love flowers, which didn't surprise me. I'm half Hungarian, I love flowers, but I didn't know that. So they gave me a bouquet of flowers at the very end of the school year. Um, these kids were absolutely precious. Um, so I was able to do quite a bit in the classroom. I also went ahead and put myself out there, which um, if any of you go overseas on a Fulbright, you'll see that there's more opportunities than just with the host institution. In Hungary, they had something called the American Corners. And what that was is the five corners of Hungary, because Hungary is kind of a square like Nebraska. And um, I went to various cities and this was on my own. This had, you know, I, I just wanted to volunteer. So I did presentations in the community. And there's, a, there's a, a shot of me. I'm giving a lecture about the first ladies. And um, I got some fun questions. When I was there in 2014, um, the Obamas were in the White House. So I got these great questions about Michelle Obama. Um, you know, they wanted to know, what about this and what about that? It was just funny things. I mean, these are like little tiny things. The other thing that I was able to do, um, and again, it depends on the country um, where you are going to apply, but for Hungary, they were participants in the Fulbright World Conference, which that year was in Berlin. So there I am, but you can't really see me. It's really dark on the bottom, but I'm standing in front of the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. And at the conference, um, there's me down below. At the conference, they asked Fulbrighters, these were Fulbrighters from all over the world who had come, if they wanted to put in to talk about what they were doing at their host institution. And I talked about teaching African-American history to Hungarians. And um, I was picked uh, to go ahead and give like this three minute presentation. That was a pretty heady moment. Um, and afterwards, I was surprised at how many Fulbrighters, especially student Fulbrighters, because there are students who can apply for Fulbright, not just, you know, teachers or administrators, but they came up to me and they said, the institution where I'm working at, where I'm teaching at, we are having issues with racism. How, how are you dealing with this? And, you know, I explained to them the reason why Ketch Kemet had asked me to teach African-American history was because in Hungary, they don't have racism like we do with systemic racism here with African-Americans, but they do have an issue with the Roma. And Roma are a group of people that are unfortunately targeted in several different countries. And Hungary was trying very hard to break down this racism to get people to be more accepting. And so that's why they wanted me in the classroom, which I found out. Um, and that was, that was a really important aha moment for me. So the impact of my Fulbright professionally, you know, I learned how to really do active learning. Uh, this is a picture of me. I was getting ready for the day in the classroom most of the classrooms in the teacher's training college, I had a chalkboard and I had a piece of chalk. And there might've been a DVD player, but usually didn't work. 
and the internet was very spotty. So I had to really do some digging deep to figure out how do I get across my points to my students. And I started doing material culture teaching. Basically, I found images of artifacts and then I would discuss using the objects um, to be able to pull my students into the conversation. For example, I had a particular class that was all girls. I don't know how that all worked out, but these women, um, I was trying to teach them conversational English. And it's a lot of their English was limited. And so I said, let's pretend we're going to have a bridal shower. And of course, they knew nothing what I was talking about, um, you know, especially in Hungary, which is only about 20 years post communism. Uh, people get married at the courthouse. It's not that big of an affair. Um, you know, it's not like here where we have these elaborate $10,000 weddings. And so I was explaining to them what a wedding shower would look like. And we played some games, you know, like most of us have been maybe, okay, guys, maybe not, but, um, you know, like the, what are the games and what do you do? And it was, and what would you eat? So um, that was a really interesting moment to kind of explain with artifacts, images, and to show them and then say, well, what would you like to do for your wedding? Anyway, I have remained friends with a lot of these students on Facebook. And as they've gotten married, they put their images up and what they did. And it was just, it was kind of exciting to, to see that play out in real time. The other thing that I did for active learning, I have a student, I have, well, some of my students are up here. We're standing in front of the Ketchikamet College and we did active learning by doing a remote. This is my African-American history class. We did a remote with the Brown versus Board of Education Park Rangers in Topeka, Kansas. They got up very um, early in the morning because Hungary is a seven hour difference from the United States. And my students stayed really late in the afternoon, which was a hardship because a lot of them took like a two hour train to come into Ketchikamet. They lived in rural areas and they were able to do a Zoom with the park rangers at the actual site in Topeka, Kansas. And they were walking them through the building. That was such a moment. I, could, I, I wasn't even watching the rangers. I was watching my students, just watching them, you know, like, oh, okay, this is real African-American history. This is where it actually happened. And then the last piece of this is, you know, I visited because of the American corners, I visited colleges, universities throughout Hungary. And almost every college I visited, they would take me into the library, their books. That was a really important piece for them. And I didn't want to be impolite because I noticed when I started thumbing through the books that a lot of them were copyrighted by 1970s, 1980s. There were very few in the 1990s. And I thought, wow, these are really out of date. So I didn't say anything, but when I got home to Metro, I started the, um, the textbook depository where anyone who had a textbook, maybe a year too old, or maybe we switched, you know, editions, um, you could go ahead and, and send your books in, in our, in our mail rooms, which I know several of you have done. So thank you for doing that. When we collected enough textbooks, Metro, courtesy of Jane Franklin, we actually paid to send 1.5 tons of textbooks to Hungary. And the Hungarian Fulbright Commission was so excited that here is one of the commission staffers and they took a picture of her and they actually wrote a story in Hungarian and put it in the newspaper and said, Metropolitan Community College has shared all these books. And then any of the university colleges in Hungary uh, could just contact the Hungarian Fulbright Commission and get books. So um, that, that was a really exciting moment. For Metro, um, you know, part of, if you do go and do a Fulbright, you are expected to do something in return for the college. And for me, um, my return was creating a new class. Um, I created Modern Europe since 1789. 
And what I did, since I knew I was creating this class ahead of time, was anywhere I traveled, because by the way, you have your teaching schedule with your host institution, but then on the weekends, if it's okay with your host institution, which it was with mine, I traveled. And Europe is kind of like back east. Um, you can go to a lot of countries in a short amount of time. So I took my camera and I took lots of pictures. And then I put the pictures together in this history course for Metro, which we're still teaching and um, use that um, for, for all the images. And of course we still have the book depository, yay. Um, we are supplying books. If anyone has a pet project, please let me know. Or if you go on a, a, a Fulbright and you want to send books to your country afterwards, please let me know. Um, I also became a peer reviewer when I got home. Um, Met or Fulbright contacted me and said, well, you know, since you've written your proposal and you had an accepted application, would you mind being a reviewer for applicants, in, in my case, it was history, um, applicants who are applying for other positions. So I would read through their applications and the way Fulbright does it, there's like three tiers of um, application levels to be accepted at the very last tier. And so I was on the bottom tier, the peer reviewers. And then of course, right now, what I'm doing is I'm an alumni ambassador and I love to talk about Fulbright. I can't talk enough about Fulbright. The last piece of this was um, the impact on me personally. Um, you know, my family did come over and visit. My kids are all adults. And so um, none of them were in school, but if you have children who are in school, you can bring them with you. Um, the host company or the host countries will generally um, adjust your housing to have you have a place that's big enough. They will help you find an elementary or junior high or high school for your child. In my case, um, these are two of my daughters. They came over and um, they visited for about two weeks. Then my husband flew in as well. Um, we're in Paris with the Louvre behind us. Um, so we were able to you know, go for a little bit and just kind of wander around. I think in total, I went to I think it was 12 other countries besides Hungary during my, my five months there. And then of course, um, my colleagues, you know, this is them, they, they threw me a going away party. This was my first attempt at a selfie. You can barely see me in the, in the corner there. And they were so kind. Um, I'm still in touch with several of them. They threw me a little party. It was non-alcoholic because they know I don't drink, but they had, they were laughing at me because in Hungary, um, like the sparkling ciders or whatever, they call them a kitty drink. I won't go ahead and translate the Hungarian word for that. And they, they were laughing that they were all drinking children's, children's li uh, liquid, you know, but they were all very kind and, and helpful. So, you know, those intercultural connections are invaluable. Um, and then this is one of the Fulbright Commission officers, um, Anna Marie, was extremely helpful um, in helping me the entire time. Um, Fulbright, again, I, I can't stress how much of a gold standard they are. The minute my application was accepted, um, Anna Maria was emailing me from the commission. She had all the paperwork. What do I need to do? Do I have to get shots? Um, what do I need for the doctors you know, to say, yes, I'm healthy to travel? Um, what about, uh, they had something called diplomatic pouch where I was able to like send through our post office um, all kinds of teaching supplies ahead of time. So they were already there for me. Um, they were extremely helpful. There, there was no dumb question. Uh, I can't even tell you how many emails went back and forth. And then this is another Fulbright grantee. Um, this is Galen. He's an artist. Um, you know, you don't have to have a PhD to go ahead and apply for Fulbright. Um, you know, his experience, his expertise, he was able to do a Fulbright. And then there were other countries that were interested in him and he stayed afterwards um, to do other projects. And in fact, he's still overseas doing other projects. So, um, you know, there, there's a wealth of opportunity. If you are wondering, okay, so how do I do this? 
um, you will go to this page and you will click on here, um, CIES.org. This is the catalog of awards. And then I would strongly suggest, even if you're thinking, well, I don't know, do I want to do this or not? Um, go there and register that you're interested. Because if you do this, let me see if I can actually get this to work. Hang on a second. I'm going to stop sharing. And then I'm going to go back to that page. Amy, yeah, while you're ahead. getting to that page, if I, I just wanted to jump in. Mm -hmm. in case we lose anybody since we're getting close to the end. But there's yes. a couple of things that I wanted to pull out of your um, presentation just to highlight. I really love your honesty that you applied once and didn't make it because I think that's really super, super important to recognize that um, that probably happens more often than not and you should not give up. It doesn't mean that you are not a qualified candidate, it just means you probably need to adjust something or find a better part, you know, something in there just wasn't coming out at the top, right? Um, community colleges have been sought out and they continue to be sought out across the board at Fulbright, but all sorts of national awards because we want to diversify the rep, the, the US as a country wants to diversify the representation um, across the board in global and international projects, right? So um, while it may seem that this is, you know, just currently a time they care about community colleges, I want you to know that they do, they have, and it continues to be an effort. So um, your applications will be, I always tell students on um, scholarships, et cetera, that are similar to that, um, it's kind of like you have a plus point already when you come from a community college. So that's that's something I want you to uh, keep in mind. And although Fulbright remembers their long-term um, Fulbrighters like Amy, and I'm trying to think if it was Pat Smith or P Pat Smith's husband might've been doing something. I don't know exactly who they're referring to, who was the previous person, but we had at least one short-term Fulbrighter that they, you know, Fulbright changes staff and they don't, you know, whatever, you know, <laughs> maybe their records don't show those. But if you remember Daryl Hansen, who's fairly recently retired from the college, there was a point where he was faculty in human services and then he became dean of business area. He went to Turkey and he, he probably didn't have to ask for a sabbatical because it was somewhere in the area of a two month experience, maybe a little bit less than that. And I think it hit the summertime, right? So um, there are those varied opportunities can work for you if you don't um, feel that you can jump into the longer experience. And I did wanna also throw out, and Amy can verify this. I believe if you have a situation where you need to take family members, I believe that Fulbright adjusts your stipend to handle that also. Is that accurate in your mind, Amy? Yep, that is correct. Okay. All right, I'll be quiet. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm, I'm glad that you said something because please don't think that the only Fulbright is the U.S. Fulbright Scholar Corps that I did. There are Fulbrights of all time frames and all disciplines. Um, you know, like if you are um, a professional and you dance, um, there are Fulbrights. This, um, the, the Fulbright recently have created something called the Fulbright Specialist where you can apply to be put like on a roster for up to a year and any host country who might be interested in your discipline could contact you. And the Fulbright specialist, you'd only be overseas anywhere between two to four weeks, that's it. So, um, you know, please don't think, oh, I have to do a sabbatical and I'm gonna be gone so long, you, you don't. Um, there are all different kinds of awards and many disciplines that you could apply for. Um, I did want to just really quickly, I, I wanted to show you, you all can see this, right? Where it says the Fulbright US program, yes? Okay, here's the catalog of awards. And Liliana, as promised, I'm gonna go ahead and to get the largest amount, I'm not gonna be too specific. Isaac and I were trying this before we started. And I realized that um, if you just put in the country, sorry if I'm making anybody go dizzy, 
Um, if you just put in a country, and I know you said Romania, and th by the way, these are the 160 countries, in case you're wondering, what is this list? And then I'm gonna click on search awards. I'm not gonna do the region or the discipline. And these are, let's see, we have six awards that'll show you. And that, by the way, um, like if you filled out an application, it would not be until 2022, 2022, 2023. It's always a year ahead because obviously most of us cannot just drop and run. We have things we have to put into place. But here are the different awards and the different places and the universities. And then you would just click on any of these and you would say, okay, um, what are the parameter of the words? So I'm gonna pick Bucharest because I think Liliana mentioned that. And this is the University of Bucharest and there's the award details. And this is what they would like you to do. But again, if you have something a little bit out of their area or their want, I would strongly suggest getting a hold of them and asking. Now, this one is four months. Um, they are asking between October and February. Most of the longer ones, the, the several months, it's during the school year because that's, you know, so you can be interacting with the students. And then here's the program staff. There is Kimberly Williams' phone number and there is her email. So if you look at this and say, hmm, I don't know if this really works or not. Please go ahead and get a hold of the program staff and um, ask. There again, that's that's what we do. As an alumni, I've had people emailing me and asking all kinds of questions and saying, "Well, what about this and that?" If I back out of here, I wanted to show you something else in case you were interested. Let me go back just one more to this page. Okay, and um, besides all of this, you could go to my Fulbright and you could register for a webinar. So in case you're interested after today, but you think, oh, I really need to hear more. Here are all these webinars that are being offered. Um, we've got one coming up here next week. This one's for Finland. Um, this one's for postdoc, hint, hint, Ryan. Um, they're HBCUs. Um, you have ones for um, the administrators, college, community college administrators program. Here's one for Russia. Um, you can tune into these. Go ahead and, and you know, make the time to do this. And that's, that's another way that you can, um, when you join, if you register your interest, you will automatically be emailed and saying, oh, okay, this is what's going on. Be, be aware of this. Um, there are news and events. You know, there's blogs. Um, if you think, oh, like Liliana, I'm gonna use you an example. You could go to the Find Fulbright Alumni and you could go ahead and type in the country and you could pull up Romania in case you're thinking I need more people to speak with. And you could go ahead and just see who pops up. Maybe there's some Fulbright alumni um, that you might be able to say, well, how was your project? How, how did you do your proposal? And then it'll just take you right to it. And there you go. These are various people with their projects and what year. And we're all still on a roster. Um, you know, someone told me the Fulbright, it's like a Marine. Once a Fulbright, always a Fulbright. And so you could contact any of these people and they're in various areas. And then you can read about their project and what did they do? And yeah, there's a whole bunch of pages here. So that's a really good resource in case you're wondering, well, you know, who, who would I speak with? Okay, um, last but not least, the competition has opened this year. It started, it opened in February. And if you're interested in applying for 2022 to 2023, you have until September 15th of 2021. If you are interested, I would strongly suggest, look at that application. It is lengthy. You, you do need to have references. 
you do need to write your proposal. Um, I think when I did it, they shortened it, but I think it was 23 pages when I did it. It took me a couple of months, but again, um, as Barbara said, most people I spoke with, very few people I spoke with got uh, a Fulbright application accepted on the first try. Um, most people, it was two to three tries that it took. Um, last but not least, and Barbara can probably fill us in more on this, so I'm not gonna stay on this too long, but you have Fulbright Scholar in Residence program, where let's say you're teaching a particular subject area or you're very involved or invested in a professional project, you want to host a scholar from another country. So you could get a hold of Fulbright and say, who do you already have um, or who do you have that's maybe applied for a Fulbright and has done one in, in maybe India? Or let's say you have a Fulbright who's um, a Fulbright overseas, who's doing their Fulbright in the United States. They will tell you, oh yeah, there, there's one in Iowa. Do you wanna have that person sent over to Metro to do a presentation? Or maybe if you're teaching languages, um, you would like a native speaker from a country to talk with your class. And again, you would have to work with Barbara through this, you know, as our Fulbright liaison. Okay. There's I some believe of the those are basically institutional applications, but Amy's correct. Um, you if you have a special interest, then we can take it to the levels to determine whether the college wants to make that application. And that lecturer fund is really quite simple. Um, so that one's not quite such a big deal. To have someone actually come and reside on campus for a, a quarter or longer, that's, that will require a little bit more work at the highest levels of the institution. Uh, the good thing is Fulbright does not charge the, the host institution anything. I mean, yes, we would, you know, provide the housing for someone like on, um, you know, Fort Campus, but Fulbright does not charge for that. Okay, last but not least, and I'm sorry, because we don't have that much time left, but we do have time. So um, any questions for me, and there's my email. And, you know, if you think of something after this and say, well, what about that? Or I, I just, you know, want to hear what was it really like being overseas? I, I'm, I'm happy to chat. So does anyone have any questions? We've got about four golden minutes before we have to conclude this presentation. Well, actually, if we run over, we're okay, right, Isaac? Oh. Are we? I'm not aware of yes. anything that means we have to shut down. It's, yeah, we yeah there's, if we go a little over, that's fine. Okay, and I, and I put the awards, the link here. So if anybody else wants to play, Karina, do you, do you have a... A country of choice. I mean, do you want to, I mean, I'm happy to open this up and you can just write this down. And it's like, um, it's like Dr. Doolittle. I used to love those books where he would just spin the globe, you know, and he'd put his finger and it's like, where am I going? That's kind of what I look like with, with this awards because 160 countries go, where do you start? So did Karina, did you have one that you want to pick? Um, probably Panama. Just Panama. Not a whole lot going on academically, you know, in the canon for Panama. So trying to put okay. it on something other than the canal. Okay. Let me see if I can get it open. And we're just gonna go ahead and we'll we'll get you whoopsie. Now that I just did that. Um let's go ahead and scroll through. And it's just scrolling. I just mm -hmm. Remind you, many of you have terminal degrees, but not all awards require it. So we just have to really search to see what fits your um, academic background. Yes, thank you for, for saying that because yes, you don't have to have a PhD and you don't have to have a book published to apply. Um, again, every single award is different. Um, Karina, do either one of these look interesting? One says all disciplines. I'm definitely not science and technology. So, okay. Um, oh, and that that is actually a tip. When you go to apply, the broader you are with the award that you pick, 
the better your chances of being accepted. So this one, again, it's like all disciplines. You could do any of these various things. This one does say that it has flex option. So maybe you could turn this into like a two to three year project and you go down there like two months at a time because the award length is six to nine months, but it does offer flex, which is fairly new. So let's see here. Ooh. I might say that flex option, having um, worked outside the US, I think that's really beautiful because the initial stages of an experience are so much learning for you. And if you could continue to go back on a yearly basis, my, my hunch is you could, um, you could accomplish so much more because you would have the time in between to be thinking about, well, that didn't seem to work, et cetera, et cetera. So I love that flex option. And um, we do have a question I wanna make sure gets answered. Um, okay. A faculty member wants to know about the option for others at Metro to use sabbaticals. And I'm really sorry to say, because I think sabbaticals are marvelous and I wish everybody could get them. My understanding is the only uh, category of employment at Metro that has the opportunity to sabbatical is a faculty member. Um, so if you were going to do a Fulbright or pursue a Fulbright and you're not faculty, you would really need to talk to your supervisor about what options you have. Yeah, that, that is unfortunate. And of course it has to be every seven years and yeah. And you have to have good evaluations, which of course we all do, so yeah. I, I would like to address a question, uh, Amy and Barbara related to the flex option. So if it's for instance, for two months or let's say six to nine months as we had in the previous example, um, is it possible to um, for Fulbright um, to accept, to continue the project? Can it be a project for two, three, five years to collect information like feedback on how the project is applicable? So would they give you another two months, maybe some other time or a month to go and continue with updates on applicability or what, what has been done? <clears throat> Based on your experience, do we have such situations? Um, they do, if it's flex, yes, you can do that. If there isn't a flex option in the award, not, you can't, but that particular award did say flex. So then yes, you, you could go ahead and do that. And I think Amy, on the previous flex that you talked about, it said up to a certain number of years. Mm -hmm. I don't know if everyone is limited. I thought you said like two to three years over that period. Right. It, it usually is two to three. Um, it's a fairly new option that they just added about two, three years ago. And part of the reason why they added it is because they really want community college professors who may or may not have done their seven years of teaching so they can get that sabbatical because that was a roadblock for, for many of us. You know, it's like, oh, okay, well, maybe I haven't taught here long enough to apply, but that way you could actually do it. Amy, let me ask another question. Um, mm -hmm. Must you, if, you're, if you are doing a faculty type Fulbright, must you be full-time at your institution? Hmm, I, ooh, that's a good question. I think that would be It was probably, that yes, but I'm not positive. I'd have to go back and look. Oh, I don't know. Um, I know you have to be, um, well, I don't know, because actually you can, hmm. I know there are Fulbrights who have been awarded who are independent scholars. So I don't know. Um, if whoever asked that question, if you could email that to me, Barbara, um, I can find out. I can get you an answer. I will just contact headquarters in Washington, DC and ask the Fulbright because I, I don't know. That's it may depend really on the question. award. Yeah, it may depend I, on a specific award. So that's even more reason to really read through those postings, but we, we can get an answer for everybody on that. Yeah. 
Hmm. Good question. All right. Anyone else? I know we're we're past time, and you've been extraordinarily patient. And I think I hope a couple of you will apply. And if you do, please let me know. I'm I'm happy to share my proposal. The only um, disclaimer I'm going to go with that, and this is what the person who shared their proposal with me before I applied said, if you go ahead and um, borrow my proposal and just kind of look it over the next time after you get your Fulbright, somebody approaches you and says, well, I don't know how to write a proposal. Um, you have to share it with that person. So that, that's my only, um, my only addendum with doing that. May I add, this is really like elementary. <laughs> But because I have received applications that were like somebody lifted and pasted a lot of the same information that a previous applicant had done. Um, and I've read other, other scholarship type things too. Please don't even consider doing that because I know how skilled you all are. And, th and that incident, it really changed my opinion about that. I knew how talented the person was, and I was horrified. I mean, and it was a cut and paste job that made the final application not make any sense because they didn't read what they cut and pasted well enough. So don't think you can get away with that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The, the Fulbright office has all these applications. Please don't plagiarize. Yes. Uh, you're, golly, somebody actually did that? Ouch. Well, I know none of us would do that, but yeah. Yeah. Um, Obviously, it is very personal to you. So you, you need to have whatever you're talking about with your host institution. I would hope that, yeah, it, it would be something that, that you care about and you're passionate, um, whatever you're doing. So uh, a question, Amy or uh, Barbara, uh, one of you mentioned that the um, due date for application is September this year, will be 1st of September. Do you know by chance? It is September 15th of this year is the last day you can go ahead and apply for 2022 to 2023. And if you're like me, I'm always planning years ahead. So if you're thinking, you know, I want to go 23, 24, then just kind of watch for it because it always opens in February. And you can go to the Fulbright, Fulbright site and it'll say... Um, you know, the applications will be opening shortly. And oh, by the way, all of the awards that I was showing you for these 160 countries, they change every year. So don't think, oh, I didn't see anything in Panama. Um, don't give up on it, Karina. Go back the next year because um, you may see something different. Also, let's say you're like Liliana, that you're going overseas. You know, there's nothing wrong with going to a host institution that you would like to be at and approaching them to apply for a Fulbright. Um, it works the other way too. Or Karina, if you know something in Karina or in Panama that you think, oh, I showed you that list of universities and you think, well, that one's not on there. The one I wanna teach at. It's okay to contact them and ask um, because it is, it is very prestigious for the institution and of course for the institution where we're teaching at to, to have that Fulbright connection. So Amy, is it a, a special type of document or, or Barbara maybe knows that we, the host institution, if they're interested, will fill in so we can attach to our uh, proposal? Good question. The institution, it's like, a, you know, when you ask someone for a letter of recommendation, that's kind of what it looks like. And they'll put it on their letterhead, but they will work with you to put in what you have negotiated. But that letter of invitation, I can't stress this too much. That's really important. If you want your application to be seriously considered, it is best, even if the award, the instructions say you don't necessarily need one, Fulbright really likes it when you have a plan instead of just making Fulbright somehow make it happen for you. The more work you do, the more outlining, the more mm -hmm. this is exactly what I'm gonna do in your proposal, the better the chances. And yes, I did include my letter of invitation. So that, that's a key point. 
Thank you, Amy. Uh, is it any type of, is it a template for letter of invitation on the Fulbright site or not? It's not a specific one. Just no, um, oh, I'm sorry. I, every, every host will be different. I, I've seen so many different letters of invitation when I was doing the peer review for other people's applications and they, it, it varied. Um, just how they, some of them were extremely formal and they had like the president of the country signing off on it. And some of them were very informal, like an email type setup. So it, it just depended how that letter of invitation looked. Is it possible to share some of the professionally done or well done type of letters of invitation or this is a more of a, a private? Can, can you address the question this to Fulbright? Um, share. I would ask the program staffer associated with the award that you're interested in about that piece of it. Thank you. So then question to Barbara and, and to Amy. Uh, if we edit a, a proposal, would you spare 15, 30 minutes to tell us this is out, this is missing, whatever, just uh, at least five minutes and, and Barbara, I, I will try, I don't know, I'm, I'm planning, we'll see if how fast I can do that in July, August. When will be the latest to present to both of you because of the September 15th upcoming due date? I don't, I don't know if I can make it, I will try, that's the plan, but I need some due dates. <laughs> so typically, I'll see um, every institution, I'll the right rep, is allowed to post their own date for submissions because of that for their, their community. I, I would typically say one month ahead, but that would fall right about the time if you're teaching in the summer that you go on break. So for me, that probably would not be very fair. For me, I work through that period, but um, you know, maybe August 1st, what do you think, Amy? Oh, I, I think it's fair any any time. I, I wouldn't I've I've looked at people's applications and I have helped. I, I would definitely give yourself a month ahead because whatever my suggestions or Barbara's suggestions are, you need time to implement those suggestions. Um, I had someone recently who sent me an application and it was just kind of all over the place and I gave them lots of feedback. She needed lots of time to adjust it. So it depends on yourself. How, how quick can, can you readjust? Oh, uh, it depends on how things evolve in, um, in Romania, but I will be there um, June, uh, let me see, July and a portion of August. So I, I needed to know, so because I'm going also, it's a business trip, but also for personal matters. Uh, as I mentioned before, my father passed in, in, in November and because of the guarantee, I could not uh, be there physically present. Even if I would go, I will not have been allowed to uh, go anywhere uh, two weeks. So it's a matter of going you know, to the cemetery and family and all of that, but then I can readjust the, I mean, the process of establishing business meetings in different cities. So based on that, then I do that first and then I take care of other things like visiting. For me, I'm gonna say August 1st. <clears throat> okay. And I mean, I, August 1st draft, right? Draft. Draft, yes. I guess parts of that application that are going to need review more than others, right? So I will edit in Barbara before I'm leaving to Romania. If we'll see if it will be 2022, 20, 23, or the next year, but I'm thinking about this since, since long. I actually wanted to contact Amy since she went there. And then another comment, final comment. What a pleasure and wonderful thing to see Budapest is one we mm -hmm. have many nice cities in Europe Budapest it's in the top of my list beautiful and this is because the queen of Austro-Hungarian empire was so much loved by the king and she didn't want to stay in Vienna in Wien she wanted to go to Budapest and because of uh, his love for her he gave her all the money that she wanted to build whatever she wanted. So all the, all the beautiful, unique buildings and um, symphonic music and goulash and all the 
wonderful food in Hungary, please. Yes, visit Bucharest, Dracula Castle, Transylvania, Romania. If you want to go there, let me know, but please visit Budapest, beautiful city. So I'm mm. glad that Amy could go and I'm pretty sure that she will go back. Thank you well, for sharing, Amy. Definitely. And Barbara for organizing this, really appreciate you. Oh, you're welcome. And, and if anyone's worried about your waistline, the good thing about Europe is you do a lot of walking. So even though I ate my way through Europe, I actually lost weight by the time I got home, which was crazy considering what I ate. But um, lot, lots of good cultural sharing. So anyone else have a question before we wrap up? And if you think of something after this, feel free to email me privately and you know, just check in. Um, again, it's a lot with the application, but it's, you know, it's very doable. It's just lengthy, that's all. And I just wanna say thank you to Dr. Force. Um, and another comment that I should have pulled out previously was um, her point about, you know, you make your application, you have your plan, um, everything works, you get accepted, you go, and then things might not be exactly as you expect when you get there. It's really super important in almost anything outside of your home that you endeavor to do that you're ready to flex because um, you'll be surprised how much you learn from not feeling like it has to be just like it was in your classroom at home or in your community at home. It, it's not simple, but if you can go with that expectation, I think you will feel, you, you'll, you'll be primed for success sooner. If you go in and you're like, all I got is a chalkboard and a piece of chalk, uh, what am I gonna do? You'll struggle a little bit with that, right? So um, final comment, Amy, what, and because I want people to know we're not trying to get you out of Metro, we're trying to help you um, with an experience you might love that makes you even a better contributor at Metro. So Amy, what about, what in general about your experience as a Fulbrighter made you a better teacher, instructor at Metro? Oh, good question, Barbara. Um, I can unequivocally say it was learning to use material culture. I have completely changed the way I teach my classes. In fact, I just finished writing a book on re-examining the women's movement using material culture objects because of what I learned, literally learned in the Hungarian classroom, how to reach my students. I feel like my classes are so much richer. I feel like my students are much more engaged because I'm engaged, I'm finding these, these artifacts and objects. And sometimes I actually have physical things I bring in. Well, hopefully when we're face-to-face -face in the fall again, I have missed that. Um, but I've been bringing them into the classroom. And at the end of the quarter, I'll say to the students, you know, what did you remember most? The objects. So yeah, it has changed the way I teach immeasurably. I, I don't think I would have thought of that if I hadn't been faced with a chalkboard and chalk and students whose English was good, but you know, not with the nuances and slangs and the way we talk sometimes loosely. So I, I learned a great deal about how to teach. So I, I can definitely thank Fulbright for that. Thank you, Amy. Will you share please where we can find your book or can maybe, would it be okay, Barbara, to diffuse if Amy agrees when, when we can purchase it to let us know where we can find it. I'm sure that we can all learn from it. Sure. Thank you. It, it's coming out in December, University of Nebraska Press. And yes, I will drop you a line. And hopefully you. you'll be knee deep in your application. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. It was a really fun morning. Thank you so much. And please let me know if anybody's interested. So thanks.